Welcome to another episode of Costume Cinematographico. In this episode, I'll be doing an extensive analysis of the costumes of Joffrey Baratheon from the HBO series Game of Thrones. Before we get started, I have an announcement that I want to make. As the channel grows, I'm changing up the style of the videos a little bit to make it easier for you to watch. So upon the request of a YouTuber, I will now include the closed captioning feature on all of my future videos. So if you want to see that feature, you will have to enable it on your device. So let me know in the comments if there is anything else you would like to see in upcoming videos. As well, I am planning my first Q&A video to air in the coming weeks. So if you have any burning costume related questions, please leave them in the comment section below. Your question can be about any character from Game of Thrones, either one that I've already covered or a new one. You can also ask a specific question about a character's costume from another movie or series, or just a general costume question. I'll make an announcement in the next few weeks about when that will air, and if you want to keep up with all of my latest videos, make sure to hit the subscribe button. So without further ado, let's get to Joffrey, easily the best dressed male character in King's Landing, if not all of Westeros, and a warning that there will be spoilers for the entire six seasons of the HBO series Game of Thrones. Upon the death of King Robert, Joffrey was crowned King of the Andals and the First Men, Lord of the Kingdoms and Protector of the Realm. Joffrey was a spoiled child, a cruel and brutal leader who was ultimately poisoned at his own wedding feast. Joffrey is portrayed by Irish actor Jack Gleason, who was 18 at the time of shooting, although the character he portrays is supposed to be about 16. He was born in Cork, Ireland, the same hometown as my grandmother. You might have seen him as a little cutie in the movie Reign of Fire from 2002, strangely another medieval feature film about fire-breathing dragons. Jack Gleason has since retired from acting to pursue other interests. By legitimate standards, Joffrey Baratheon is the firstborn son of Queen Cersei and King Robert Baratheon, although he is actually a product of a secret incest between twin siblings, Cersei and Sir Jaime Lannister, Joffrey's maternal uncle. Joffrey is the older sibling of Marcella, whose betrothal to Prince Tristan Martel was arranged by his uncle Tyrion, and Tommen, who was crowned king upon Joffrey's orchestrated death by poisoning. Joffrey's grandfather and family patriarch, Tywin Lannister, acted as both Joffrey and Tommen's hand until he was murdered by his youngest son, Tyrion. Joffrey's family's sigils are both the black stag rampant on a gold field for Baratheon and the golden lion rampant on a crimson field for Lannister. Before King Robert's death, Joffrey copied the fashions of both his father and mother. Meanwhile, the sigil of King Joffrey Baratheon combines the heraldry of both houses. You might notice, however, that the lion's tail encroaches onto the Baratheon side of the shared sigil. Once he is crowned king, Joffrey's choices in clothing are determined more by his own tastes as his mother has less control over him. As an example, after Robert's death, Joffrey orders the Great Hall redecorated back to the former Targaryen style, a taste that Joffrey greatly admires. He has the vines removed from the columns and the candelabra replaced with large, flaming metallic braziers. He also replaces the stained glass window behind the throne with a seven-pointed star, the symbol for the faith. Joffrey also wants control over how he dresses. He clears the throne room of any vines and flowers because in his mind it shows weakness, and in the same way he wants his wardrobe to represent strength. As an example of this, in the season three episode, Dark Wings, Dark Words, Joffrey barks at the royal tailor who shows him fabric swatches with floral prints while being fitted for a new coat. Instead, he prefers the red velvet printed with gold daggers, threatening but still beautiful. Pictured is costume designer Michelle Clapton adding final touches to this finished coat. The Lannisters are very wealthy, competitive, they live in the capital and power is important. 
Michelle Clapton says, It's warm on the coast, which means there is trade and they don't have to worry about keeping warm. They have a large staff with silks and jewelry readily available to them. Clapton says of clothing the royal family, There is an opulence to the court as a society influenced by its environment, with brighter colors, intricate jewelry, exotic fashions. Joffrey's clothes reflect his royal circumstances, first as a prince and then as a king. He wears a combination of dyed leathers and rich brocades and velvets with medieval and renaissance influences. This is one of the only ways he knows to show his power, that and his cruelty. Joffrey's coats are most likely inspired from the doublet, a popular men's Western European fitted jacket that came to prominence between the 14th and 17th century. As seen on the left, this beautifully preserved embroidered silk doublet on exhibit at the V&A in London was made in Britain between 1620 to 25. Another similar item, the jerkin, is a close fitting sleeveless jacket, oftentimes made of leather. The 17th century silk and jute jerkin with an elongated skirt, seen on the right, is from the Metropolitan Museum in New York and was most likely worn under armor. Here is a picture of a man's black doublet with gold brocade trim from 1555, worn by Ferdinand II, the Archduke of Austria. Like Joffrey's coat, this doublet has the stand-up collar and wings. It also has a short peplum, or skirt, cut separately and attached at the waist. Joffrey's coat also appears to take some inspiration from the Indian Sherwani coat, a formal garment worn by nobles dating back to the Delhi Sultanate, a Muslim kingdom, and the Mughal Empire, which ruled most of India and Pakistan in the 16th and 17th centuries. By the late 18th century, the coat was adopted as the traditional dress of the common man and today is still used in India and Pakistan as wedding attire and for formal occasions. Here are two examples of the Shirwani. You'll see that the one on the right is a late 19th century, early 20th century painted portrait of a nobleman wearing a velvet Shirwani that's heavily embroidered in gold. While many of the Game of Thrones costumes are extensively broken down, many of Joffrey's costumes look brand spanking new, like this set of armor worn in season two. Unlike Ned Stark, who seems to only own one doublet despite his family status, Joffrey appears to have an entire wardrobe, sometimes never wearing the same costume twice. When asked which male character has the most clothes, designer Michelle Clapton says, for the men, Tywin had a few, I guess it was Joffrey. Joffrey had the most costumes. Joffrey's burgundy velvet cloak with the black fur collar and two leather cross straps is similar to the designs of the Stark cloaks worn by the entire Stark family. He wears this in the series premiere, Winter is Coming. You also get a peek at Joff's cravat tucked into his collar. Being in the north and not in a port town like King's Landing means that the Starks can only access local furs, natural dyes, and homespun fabrics compared to the rich colors and fabrics of the Lannisters. Under his cloak, Joffrey wears a red leather doublet-like coat with a knee-length skirt. His coats follow a similar cut and construction, a fitted torso with a center front opening with a, knee a long knee-length skirt, a stand-up collar and wings or epaulettes. Apparently, there are no buttons used in the Game of Thrones universe. Don't quote me on that, but I think I read that somewhere. So, this particular jacket is laced at the front through metal grommets. Like his mother's own clothing, the skirt has two arched side panels or gores, a cut that we see in most of Joffrey's jackets, sometimes in a contrasting fabric. Under his coat, he always wears black pants and tall black leather boots. Here is a simple illustration of the structure of Joffrey's style of coat, as seen through all four seasons. The front and the back of the coat are cut in the same way. The front and back panels are cut in two pieces and meet at the center front and back, while the arch side panels are cut as one piece. All of Joff's sleeves are two-piece set-in sleeves. In episode two, The King's Road, Joffrey wears a variation of the coat. 
this time with brocade bishop style sleeves gathered into leather cuffs with an interesting tuck scene here. This is a medieval throwback to the slash sleeves or sleeve within a sleeve. The dotted sleeve brocade appears later in the season, made into Joffrey's cape in the episode Baylor. In this picture, Joffrey still has his longsword lion's tooth before Arya tosses it into the river. The name is in reference to his mother's family sigil. You can see the breakdown of the costume on the shoulder and seams. Hair designer Kevin Alexander cut Joffrey's hair short to make his character look younger. As well, he had to dye actor Jack Gleason's naturally dark blonde hair, an important plot point, with daily touch-ups while shooting the series. Joffrey's costume at the tourney in episode 4 mirrors his father King Robert's own chocolate brown doublet. The addition of the crimson cape, perhaps a faux suede or fur, shows Joffrey's allegiance to both his family houses, Baratheon and Lannister. Here are two fabrics that the cape might be made of, albeit in a different color. On the left is a brown faux fur with a reptilian laminate from Mood Fabrics in New York. And pictured on the right and looking more like the fabric in Joffrey's cape is a laminated metallic faux fur in purple and black from B&J Fabrics in New York. That one is a bit pricey at $65 a yard, but it would make such an amazing looking cape. Joffrey's brown coat has detachable sleeves, laser-cut brass swings on the shoulders, and front closures as seen here in the episode Lord Snow. Under the coat, Joffrey wears a soft green poet shirt that matches Cersei's gown. In my opinion, I think this shows his loyalty for her for now. Here's a good close-up of the brass laser-cut clasps. After Robert's death, Joff begins to go almost full Lannister with his costume, as seen here in the Season 1 episode, Baylor. Over his red leather coat from Episode 1, Joffrey wears an ecru dotted brocade cape with the machine-embroidered Lannister lion sigil on the hanging cape sleeves. The coat is lined with the same brocade as his cape, but dyed red to match the leather. Joffrey wore this doublet at the top of the season. Showing their solidarity, Joffrey and Cersei's costumes are perfectly matched until Joffrey makes his first independent decision, the beheading of the traitor Ned Stark. In this close-up, you can see Joffrey's stag brooch worn at the nape of his collar and his golden crown. Steenson's jeweler in Belfast, Ireland is the maker of many of the crowns and jewelry pieces from Game of Thrones, including Joffrey's golden crown. According to their website, it states, his crown was made in sections that were painstakingly hand cut out of five millimeter sheet brass. The cut antlers were filed by hand to round off the hard edges, bent and shaped to give the three dimensional look and then textured using a burr tool, similar to a dental drill. The main headband was made from brass strip, shaped and textured in the same way as the antlers. Finally, the crown was highlighted with amber gemstones to catch the light and give the piece a rich and royal character. In episode 10, Fire and Blood, Joffrey wears another brocade coat with contrasting arched panels. This coat has the same brass fasteners and a contrasting cavalier style velvet cape slung over his right shoulder. In this shot, you get a better idea about the color and texture of both the coat and cape. The coat is a bronze and burgundy, burgundy brocade, while I think this is the same cape from episode 4. We also get a good look at Joffrey's signet ring with a red gemstone. In the season 2 episode The North Remembers, Joffrey wears a velvet brocade coat with contrasting crimson velvet arched gores and sleeves for his name day celebration. This coat has no wings, but instead in extended arched shoulders, and it's looking very royal with the false hanging sleeves. Joffrey adopts many of these architectural elements in his clothes to make him appear larger than his slight stature actually is. Joffrey wears a black leather belt with a brass buckle and star rivets, knotted stylishly at the side, and where he occasionally houses his sword. You can see in this image that the sleeves and coat are lined in bronze silk. In addition to his signet ring on his left hand, Joffrey adds a ring with a black stone to his middle finger and a ring to his right index finger. 
Jewelry and accessories are another way for young for the young king to feel empowered. Here's a variation on this look where Joffrey adds his cape, steel and brass collar and black leather gauntlets. He wears this costume while preparing for the siege of Stannis' army in season, the season two episode, The Prince of Winterfell. The sword that Joffrey wears is unnamed, but if you look closely, you can see the brass lion head on the pommel and sheath. Later in the episode, Joffrey wears pretty much a reproduction of the other coat. This one is also made from a gold and crimson red brocade with contrasting crimson textured taffeta sleeves and arched panels. The garment is lined in bronze silk and also fastened in the front with bronze clasps. In the season two episode, Garden of Bones, where Joffrey orders Sansa brought to the throne room to answer for her brother's treason, Joffrey wears this absolutely stunning woven brocade coat with a velvet sash tucked into his belt in the same fashion as his grandfather Tywin. The velvet burgundy sash is lined in bronze silk and the coat closes with the same brass fasteners as his previous coat. In this image where Joffrey threatens Sansa's life with his crossbow, you can clearly see the seaming of the two-piece sleeves and the shoulder wings or epaulets as they are sometimes called. Attached to his belt, Joffrey wears a pouch to house his arrows and on the right side, a shot of the crossbow alone. Without the sash, you can see the beautiful gold motif of the fabric on a purple background. As well, there is a little hint of a crimson cravat under his coat. Here is a close-up of the rich woven brocade with the brass fasteners. According to Top Fabric in London, this is the actual fabric used for Joffrey's coat. The fabric is a heavy Banaras brocade imported from India in aubergine, a sort of red-purple color. It's pricey though, it's over a hundred US dollars a meter. Varanasi brocades originate in Varanasi in northern India. Famous for their muslins and silks, the city is known as one of the finest makers of brocade in India. The quality of this fabric is partly what makes the coat look so good, but if you are a cosplayer, it is possible to find other Varanasi brocades at a much lower price point. In this shot with Marjorie, Joffrey shows her how to shoot his bow and arrow. In the books, Jamie tells a boy at the Inn of the Kneeling Man that the crossbow is a coward's weapon and to get a spear instead. It seems suitable then that Jamie's own son, who is indeed a coward, owns such a weapon. The gorgeous crossbow was made by the props masters of Game of Thrones. On the show, in a kind of poetic justice, Tyrion kills his father Tywin while sitting on the privy with Joffrey's crossbow. While unskilled in combat and craven, Joffrey begins to wear armor pieces to give the impression of strength. Michelle Clapton says, as society is changing in King's Landing and as the war is coming, everything just tends to get a little bit more extreme. People dress up more, people armor more, it's that false security. Here is a shot of the gorget collar in combination with the cuirass or chest piece. Decorating the armor is a set of rampant lions embossed on cut brass plates secured in place with rivets. Joffrey wears an ornate set of plate armor for the episode, The Battle of Blackwater. Of this style armor, Michelle Clapton says, the Lannisters and Baratheons have more ornate armor. In King's Landing, there are street armorers, so there's competition. Whereas in Winterfell, there's one armorer whose trade has been passed down father to son. Joffrey names his newly forged sword Heart Eater and forces Sansa to kiss it. Here is a picture of the sword and its sheath and red studded belt from a Game of Thrones exhibit. Joffrey's armor is missing fods, bands that are designed to protect the front waist and hips, so it's likely that it wouldn't provide much protection, especially without a chainmail shirt or a hauberk to cover the large gaps in between the plate armor. In the picture on the left, Joffrey is actually wearing a double belt, one sitting on his natural waistline and one hanging lower to hold his sword. In the promotional shot on the right, Joffrey is wearing his regular black belt. His uncle Jamie and his grandfather, men who have actually been in battle, have a little more coverage as seen in these images. Costume armor supervisor Simon Brindle has this to say about this great house. 
The Lannister armor is more militaristic, intimidating, sinister, with a Japanese influence that's quite disarming. I was intrigued by Michelle's initial designs for the Kingsguard and the Lannister Guard. She was looking at Eastern influences, Asian, Indian, unusual references for this sort of thing, which she mixed with recognizable touchstones from Western medieval European armor. Here is an example of Japanese plate armor from the Edo period in the 18th century. This style of armor, from which the Lannister costume is loosely inspired, is constructed from iron and steel plates, while earlier versions dating back as far as the 4th century Japan are made from laminated leather. Here is an early 17th century portrait by Flemish painter Anthony van Dyck of Emmanuel Philibert, Duke of Savoy, wearing an ornate set of Spanish tournament armor. Notice that this armor has fods to protect the front waist and hips, unlike Joffrey's set of armor. On the right is the actual set of armor from 1606 worn by Philibert in the painting. However, only traces remain of the original gilt finish of the decorative motifs, which stood out against a darkened background that has also worn away. Here is a head-to-toe shot of Joffrey's costume including his black trousers and tall leather boots. Michelle Clapton says the armor all of it's handmade and hand beaten. Some of the big armor pieces, like the King's Guard, take a long time to develop. Except for Joffrey's armor, of course, Michelle Clapton adding, Joffrey's armor doesn't get aged at all because he doesn't use it. Here is a close up shot of Joffrey's sword, Heart Eater. As well, you can see the amazing detail on the leather belt and sword frog topped with filigree with the gold embroidered brocade arch panels of his skirt. In this image, you can see the embossed lion head sigil on the pauldron and cooter, or shoulder and elbow pieces, and the rampant line on the cuirass. The brass plates and bands are engraved with a Celtic type trim. Michelle Clapton says of Joffrey's costumes going into season three, Joffrey gets a little bit more extreme in his looks. It just gets more heightened. We actually print a lot of his and Cersei's fabrics this year, which was really great so we could be much more specific. Joffrey wears this crimson velvet coat printed with gold daggers. You might remember this is the same fabric that he chose for himself in his fitting as he moved away from his mother's control and influence. He's now making decisions for himself. For a design detail, Clapton added some gold piping into the arch panel seams. For Sansa's wedding to Tyrion in the season 3 episode The Bear and the Maiden Fair, Joffrey enjoys tormenting the bride and groom by asserting his role in giving away the bride. In what is probably Joffrey's most gorgeous costume to date, Michelle Clapton tones down the red and opts for this luxurious silvery grey and gold brocade coat. The coat is cut exactly like his red and gold name day costume from season 2 with the extended shoulders and cape-like hanging sleeves. Joffrey's coat is fastened with lion-shaped brass closures. His costume also includes a velvet sash, also fastened at the shoulder with the same lion brass closure. In India and other South Asian countries, the dupatta or stole, a length of fabric worn by both women and men, is oftentimes paired with a shawani for formal events like a wedding. Here is a close-up of the rich brocade fabric and the brass lion clasp closures. Joffrey's wedding attire, like all of the members of the wedding party, is suitably decadent. Joffrey wears a gold brocade coat with a crimson cravat to tie into the Lannister colors. As you can see in the background, Tommen, Cersei, and Tywin are all wearing Lannister tones. Michelle Clapton says, This is Joffrey's wedding. It's meant to be this huge celebration of Joffrey. Remember, when he took over from his father, he redesigned the whole hall. So this wedding had to be more opulent, over the top. While the episode is called The Line and the Rose, Joffrey's wedding to Marjorie is known better as the Purple Wedding. If you look closely, you will see that Joffrey's coat is brocade, a mix of metallic gold and mauve purple threads with gold the dominant color. The arch panels of his skirt and sleeve lining is cut with the reverse side of the fabric with the purple being the dominant color. The sleeves, meanwhile, are trimmed with some delicate gimp piping. 
Here's a sample of what the gimp piping might look like, although it probably would be in gold or bronze. Also, I can't get a clear image of the silver fasteners, but they are something like the clasps seen here, really just an elaborate hook and eye. On the left is Michelle Clapton's design for Joffrey's wedding crown and pictured on the right, the final crown. Clapton explains her inspiration saying, Joffrey's crown has antlers, but roses are creeping within it. The idea is that slowly they're beginning to wrap around and control him. We wanted to represent what the Tyrells were hoping would happen. Clapton says, with the crowns, Marjorie is all creeping roses. So it was the idea that slowly Marjorie is beginning to wrap around Joffrey and control him. According to Steenson Jewelry, Jewelry, also makers of Joffrey's crown, they state antler shapes were hand cut from 5mm sheet brass, then filed, shaped, and textured. Joffrey's crown was made in four sections and soldered together. Silver buds were cast from real rose buds and intertwined through the brass. In this image, Joffrey cuts the wedding pie with Widow's Whale, one of two long swords made from Ned Stark's Valyrian steel greatsword ice. Tywin Lannister presented it as a wedding gift to his grandson Joffrey. The hilt or handle is hand molded from brass and decorated with red Swarovski crystals. The Baratheon stag is incorporated into the guard and the sheath. It took weapons master Tommy Dunn two, th two to three weeks to make. Here are a few more images of the wedding costume on display. Here is a close-up of the beautiful silk velvet sash held together at the shoulder with the brass lion clasp. The sash looks like it's made from this fabric from Top Fabric in London, a silk velvet comprised of a blue silk chiffon base and a matching blue viscose pile. As Joffrey is laid to rest, his burial costume is a gold dagger printed black velvet, similar to his red velvet outfit. I mentioned this in the Circe video, but in case you missed it, Circe has a gown made from the same fabric, although it appears to be printed silk, likewise for the lining of her other season four gown. Do you have something to add to the conversation? Then please leave a comment below. Remember that it takes several hours of research and writing put into each video. So I'd really appreciate it if you could like and share my video. And if you'd like to learn more about costumes from Game of Thrones or other shows, make sure to subscribe to my channel. Thank you so much for watching.